my older brother, who was very severely injured in a, a car accident when he was in college, ended up in what doctors now call a vegetative state. And so many of the doctors were just ready to give up on him. My parents asked, what do you think we should do? And one doctor said, uh, put him in an institution and forget you had a son. That was exactly the wrong thing to say to my parents. We took Eugene home to take care of. Ultimately, he woke up. And it was a lesson in not giving up on life, and just having its unconditional acceptance of those in need. And I think that helped to prepare me for the message of the pro-life movement. I was a theology student, first at University of Chicago and then at Catholic University of America. And I was studying moral theology, among other things. So I had a, uh, an academic uh, background to some extent in these issues. And there was a job available in the pro-life office of the Bishops' Conference. And I really hadn't had any experience or a contact with the pro-life movement up till then. But I said, well, I, I agree with that pro-life message of the church. I think that's a beautiful message. And I got a, a baptism by fire just working on public policy for the Bishops' Conference and ended up learning more than I ever had in school about where these issues were going and what the threats were. There, you know, there are many voices competing for attention on Capitol Hill and we're lucky to have Richard as, the spokes as one of the spokespersons for the church because he is extraordinarily knowledgeable and very articulate. He's someone you don't want to argue with because you're bound to lose the argument. He's very bold, but it's a benign boldness. Uh, his ability to make his argumentation without being offensive uh, in any way. And uh, he's been doing that since I've known him. I'm sorry, I want, is, I want to give Mr. Durflinger sure. an opportunity to respond. Yeah, this is what we call spin in Washington, which is a nice name for total falsehood. I remember the first ever congressional hearing on embryonic stem cell research, where I got to tell uh, Senator Specter, who was chairing the hearing, that some of the research that he wanted to fund was a felony in his home state. Richard Dorflinger is known for his depth, but his ability to make it very readable, very understandable to people who might otherwise uh, underappreciate or not understand uh, the complexities of an issue. So he can get to the essence of a pro-life issue and explain it in a way that's accessible to the general public, and yet he also gets incredible command of the technical aspects of that issue. For example, human cloning or embryonic stem cell research. I think that arguments and, and knowing the scientific background and what ethicists are thinking is, is one part of what the pro-life message needs to be. And it can't replace the other things. It cannot replace the love and the care that we need to show to pregnant women and their families. It can't replace uh, the skill of people who know how to organize and mobilize other people to make their voices heard. But uh, we need the eggheads too. I'd say Richard Dorflinger is a, a shining example of the proposition that one person really can make a difference. Because Richard is one of the greatest unsung heroes of the pro-life movement. Quietly, without pretense, looking for no recognition whatsoever. Year in and year out, for decades, he has been one of the pillars upon which the pro-life movement has been based.